as I said earlier, we have our firstborn son. And what we learned right away after we had our son is that there are a lot of opinions out there on how to raise your children. We also happen to find out that a lot of people believe that once they have raised their own children, that they're experts in the manner. For instance, one day we were sitting at a luncheon uh, with um, our in-laws, my in-laws, uh, and I'm, I'm giving my son a bottle and he's doing great, chugs the whole thing down and I just sit him up and start giving him that little burp pat right here, waiting for that burp to come out. And lo and behold, somebody comes up to me and says, oh, your son is so beautiful. I know. Uh, no, I just not what I said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to let you know that you're hitting him a little bit too hard while you're patting him on the back. (laughs) You know, my son's a one-month-old. I am a little worried about everything, you know. know, Am I hitting him too hard? I'm like, okay, well, thank you. Just hit him a little softer. Put him on your shoulder. So I do that. Hit him a little softer. No burp. I'm like, okay, thank you. I just keep doing it. She walks away. I just set him back down. I start giving that little nice hard burp. And behold, before you know it, you know, a big old gas burp comes out. And another time we were at a, a Japanese restaurant getting some sushi, and, and uh, we carried our son in because he was, he was asleep in the, uh, in the car seat. He was just fast asleep. We didn't want to take him out, put him in the high chair. So we just set him right in between us, right at this table. And we're just enjoying our meal, and our son is sleeping. It's wonderful. And, uh, but lo and behold, someone comes up to us again. Oh, your son, he's so beautiful. I know. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, you really shouldn't put the car seat on the ground because somebody could come by and kick it, spill their food on it, you know, pour hot boiling water over them. Like, ah. Um, all of a sudden, I'm freaked out. I'm like, well, where's the boiling water? <laughs> I don't want to get poured on me. Uh, and, and they said, you really shouldn't have him on the ground. I'm like, wow, geez. Um, he's sleeping. I think he'll be okay. Well, I just thought I'd let you know. All right, another expert. And then there are the, uh, the people, the, the, the ones who claim to be the experts, the ones where we always say, oh, they said. Because they said that my son should be sleeping through the night right now, uh, that he should be sleeping 12 hours from 8, a. Or 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., uh, that he should be eating uh, six times a day, six ounces every time. That's what they said. I don't even know who the they are, but apparently they said. Do they even have children? Because not everything always matches up. There are constantly voices that are telling us how we should live our lives. And that's just one of the areas in parenting. Think about all the messages that we are brought, that are brought into our lives from just maybe the the terms or the the avenue of media and, and advertisements. I saw this statistic that we see 247 advertisements a day between television, radio, uh, billboards, internet, banners. We are bombarded with advertisements. And their message generally isn't, hey, you're perfect, you're doing great, you have everything you need. No, it's saying, something's missing and you need this, and then you'll have a better life if you just had this. There is a, uh, a YouTube video out there that Dove put out, and it, it, it speaks to this perfectly. It's a picture of a young girl. She's about five years old, she's got her book back on, she's getting ready to go to school, and then it has this little soft music tone uh, that starts singing, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, and you're like, what's coming? What's coming? And there's this five-year-old girl, she's just sitting there smiling, and then all of a sudden, these images start coming in front of her about, from advertisements, advertisements of women. Advertisements of women who have been airbrushed, skinified, put in scantily clad outfits, and just presented in front of her, in front of her, in front of her. Three, four, five of them of these ads that you'll see on billboards or in subways or uh, in magazines when you open them up in the, in the Meyer section of, of these models, model after model after model, luscious lipstick or, or, you know, other, these countless different women in these outfits that you would not want to see your daughter in, in front of this woman over and over and over again, in front of this little girl. And then, and then it breaks through a little advertisement of somebody who pops up, another woman who's on like maybe uh, uh, one of those advertisements that you would find uh, on a pay, what's it called, those pay channels or not the, so advertising, infomercials, and it says, oh, you need this, it'll make you uh, skinnier, you need this, it'll make you firmer, you need this, it'll make your skin softer, you need this, it'll, you know, it'll make the things that you want bigger, bigger, it'll make the things that you want smaller, smaller, uh, everything that you need right here. 
and, and this little girl's just watching all these images, and then it cuts to these plastic surgeries and these people marking up their bodies saying, I want this short, I want this bigger, I want this smaller, and they're cutting, you know, all these, all these different scenes are flashing before these little girl's eyes at five years old. And then it, it breaks away and it just shows this little girl walking to school with her families and it just says this little line, it says, talk to your daughter about her self-esteem before the beauty, beauty industry does. And I just thought, wow, those messages. It's part of a campaign that's called uh, Real, CampaignForRealBeauty.com. And uh, it's, it's a website, check it out. On that website it says, they did a survey and found out 4% of women, 4% of women uh, across the world, they did this a worldwide survey, feel that they're beautiful. 4%. These messages are hurting. These voices are hurting women today. And men, we're sent messages too. A man has a real job. A man is tough. A man doesn't compromise. A man holds his life together. And there's nothing that can bother a real man. I was just driving the other day and uh, somebody pulled up right next side of me or I, I pulled into a lane and they came up right behind me and I must have maybe accidentally cut them off. I don't know. All of a sudden they're telling me I'm number one. And I'm driving and driving and I realize that that's not the same finger usually used for number one. And so in this uncompromising, I'm tough kind of way, I do what the right thing to do is, right? I slow down a little bit for that person and make them even later to wherever they're trying to go. I tell you, I am quite a piece of work. <laughs> God's grace is certainly sufficient. Um, this person screams off to the side of me, comes off in front of me and cuts me off as I'm driving my, my little eight-month-old son and slams on their brakes in the middle of the highway, going from 70, 75 to like 30. And I, my heart raced. I'm like, oh, man. And I felt, okay, this wasn't worth it. Me putting my toughness out there, this wasn't the right time to do it. And I promised my wife I would never do this again. I'll just get over calmly when everybody... And when anybody ever tells me I'm number one, I'm just going to get over to the side and not have any of this tough guy kind of moment. Voices. Voices who try to define our identity, try to tell us who we are, what we should do, how we should live our lives. I want to ask you a question this morning. How do we know which voice to listen to? A lot of people say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in him. But do we have Jesus as the number one authoritative voice in our life? In the time of uh, Luke's writing, there were many competing ideas, many competing authoritative voices trying to grab people's attention. Particularly, we're going to be looking at some of these Jewish apostles, and they, also, they heard voices from uh, Moses, who gave his voice and his opinion on, from the law. Elijah uh, gave his voice from the prophets. John the Baptist brought his message uh, of repentance. And what voice were these Jewish apostles supposed to be listening to? And hopefully that will speak to our story today. So as we pick up the story in Luke chapter 9, we realize that it was eight days ago that Jesus asked a particular question. Jesus had a, asked a pointed, specific question earlier in Luke chapter 9 where he said to his disciples, he got them all together and he said, the crowds are speaking. They're saying, is this guy Elijah? Is this guy John the Baptist? Who is this guy? And then Jesus asked this pointed question to him. He said, who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter, gotta love Peter, the loudmouth Peter, the guy who jumps up and so always the first to say something. He says, well, you're the Christ of God. You're God's anointed. You're the Messiah. You're the promised one. And Jesus answered this. Don't tell this to anybody. But the Son of Man must suffer many things and be, rejoiced by the, er, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Well, wait a minute. I thought I gave the right answer. Why, why would that happen to you? And then Jesus speaks of his glory that's to come in this new kingdom. And then eight days after that statement, we pick up in the apostles. All 12 of them are in the northeast corner of Israel. It's probably an early afternoon, and, and they've maybe been uh, ministering to the crowds. There's many villages out there. They're together. It's a nice day, and, then, and Jesus comes up to three of them, and he says, Peter, James, John, I want you to come with me. The rest of you stay here. 
And you could tell Peter, probably the guy who's, you know, the outspoken one, all right, I'm in the inner three again. This is good stuff. James and John whispering to one another, well, maybe it'll be like last time. Because last time when we were with Jesus alone, that was with Jairus. Remember his daughter? And everybody was wondering, what's going to happen to Jairus and his dead daughter? And then Jesus called the three of them into the room. And then the daughter was raised to life. Remember when we saw that? They start whispering to one another, we're up for something good. We're up for something great. Where are we going, Jesus? We're going up this mountain. And they look, and it's Mount Hermon. It's this mountain that's in the northeast corner. We have a picture of it. It's a mountain that's about uh, ten times the size of the biggest building in Detroit. He says, we're going up this mountain, and we're going to go pray. Okay, that sounds exciting, Jesus. (laughs) Maybe something great's going to happen. He's like, well, bring everything. Bring the tents. Bring your gear. This is going to be a journey. So they trek up this mountain. It's about, like I said, about 9,000 feet high. It would take them several hours. And they gather all their gear, and they're climbing up this mountain. They're following Jesus, and they're climbing up. And as they look out, they have the beauty of seeing Israel, the country, the towns. And they just keep climbing to seeing God's glory. They can see the Sea of Galilee in a distance and a way off. And they're climbing. It's back, the gear is getting a little bit heavy in their, you know, on their shoulders. And the air is maybe getting a little bit thinner, but they're climbing. And they're climbing. And there's just this little bit of anticipation almost starts to wear off because they've been climbing so long. And then finally, Jesus says, okay, we're here. This is it. Let's sit and let's rest. And they're exhausted. They've just carried all their tenting gear, all their dwelling shelters, all their clothes, everything they needed, and their food. And they sit down. And Jesus says, all right, let's take a break. Let's eat something. And they eat. He says, all right, let's go and pray. And I don't know about you, but when I'm tired and I pray... Generally, my head starts nodding a little bit. Same thing happened with these apostles. As they break off silently, Jesus goes away. Peter and James and John go to their own side. And they start, they start praying, well intendedly, Praying maybe for their, their ministry. Praying for what God would have them next. And next thing you know it, they're out. They are asleep. And Jesus was off praying to the side. Now, we don't know how long they slept. But we know what happened when they woke up. It was probably Peter just kind of picked up his head and thought, wow, I've been praying a long time. Mm, That was a good prayer time. (laughs) Lots accomplished. Looks over and he's like, oh, good. James and John are sleeping. Those silly apostles, they're not nearly as good as me. And then he looks over. Where's Jesus? And he sees Christ. But is that Christ? Christ. Or is it an angel? What is that? Who is that? What, what is over there? And he sees, well, wait, there's three people. That's not Jesus. Wait a minute. Well, he's dazzling. He's white. He's in glory. He's shining. It's like, I can't even look over there. And there's two other people. Who are these people? See, there was no pictures in their Old Testament Bible. It's not like he looked over there and thought, oh, I know who those guys are. But Peter, waking up, James and John, he's like, James, John, there's people over there and they're white. And he's like, well, I don't know what's going on. Well, let's do the right thing. Let's eavesdrop. Holy eavesdropping. Let's figure out what's going on. So they kind of lean over there and they're listening. They're listening to this conversation. They hear Jesus talking. He's talking about his departure. He's depart- the Greek literally says his exodus. And then you could hear some of the, the people that he's talking with reply back. He's like, I know about a departure, an exodus. I took God's people. God, God called me. He called me to lead a people to depart from this, this Pharaoh. He called me to depart from Pharaoh. He called me to, uh, to lead the people through the desert. And eventually, I had to depart this life too, Jesus. I had to walk through into the desert where I died. I never even got to see where the place I was leading the people to. And you can see maybe Peter's starting to put this together. Smart guy. Knows his Bible. I think that's Moses. He's talking to Moses. Moses led his people. Moses walked off into the desert and died. But who's this other guy? And, Eli- and, and he says, well, Elijah, tell me your story. And, and Elijah starts telling Jesus. He's like, yeah, when I departed, I got caught up in a cloud. I got caught up in a cloud and I was departed from this, from this earth entirely. And Peter starts putting together. This is, this is Moses and Elijah. And they're talking to Jesus right now? Nothing like this had ever happened in the history of the Israel people. Nothing like this has happened ever since. 
What are they talking about? And, and Christ is talking, pouring out his heart about his departure, about what's to come, his departure through the cross. Probably receiving encouragement. Moses and Elijah saying, this is it. You, got, you can do this, Christ. God is big. God will bring you through this. He is, he is big. You have been called for this purpose. And what does Peter do? But as soon as he sees they're packing up the stuff, Peter, Peter has the audacity. Peter has the nerves, the courage, I guess you could say, to jump in this conversation. Peter says, I want in on this. He says, oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. You guys are talking about leaving? Wait, 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 wait. I could just imagine Moses and Elijah and Jesus looking over and they're saying, this is the guy you picked? Um, and he's like, guys, wait, don't go. Don't go, don't go. Stay, 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 stay. Let, I, I got, we got tents. I'll make one for you, Moses. I'll make one for you, Elijah. I'll make one for you, Jesus. We'll stay, we'll hang out. No, why talk about departure? Let's, let, who's going anywhere? This is good that we're here. Let's spend some time here. Let's hang out here. No need to go anywhere. Before those words even came off, even, even finished off his tongue, this cloud comes rolling in. You know, you could think, oh, maybe it's just they're really high up in the mountain. They're like, no, this isn't one of those clouds. This is a cloud, a divine presence that envelops the, 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 the three apostles, and they shriek. You know, this is God's presence. And they, they, what do they know about God's presence? It strikes you down if you ever step in it. So they just freeze. They're like, oh. They're like thinking, great. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Look what you got us into. And they just stop. And this cloud covers them. And this voice, the voice of the Father, comes out and says, he says, this, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And as soon as the voice had spoken, the cloud disappeared. Peter and James and John look over, and it's just Jesus standing there. And they are befuddled. They, they barely even know what happened. They spend the night there, and they come down the next day, and the text says they never even spoke to anybody about this. Probably because they didn't know how to define it, how to place this, and what happened. They didn't know what happened. So... I want to ask this question, as we talked about earlier, is what kind of voice should we be listening to? And this is in your outline. You can bring this up right here. It says, how are we to respond to the transfigured Christ? How are we to respond to this picture of Christ? When God gives us his voice and says, I want you to listen to this voice as the supreme expert in your life, the number one authority, how are we to respond to that? And it says this in your, te- in your outline. It says, Jesus is God's chosen one who we need to listen to in order to align ourselves with his purposes. Again, should Jesus' voice be the supreme expert in our life? Well, we need to see Jesus as God's prophesied Messiah whose voice we need to hear so we can follow in his steps. And this has three implications for us that I want us to think about and talk through. The first one is this, implication number one. Jesus gave Peter a more accurate picture of himself as God's chosen one. Jesus gave Peter a more accurate picture of himself as God's chosen one. That's a gracious way of saying when Peter said, God, you're Christ's anointed one, he had a view of Jesus about about this big. He's saying, you're the promised one. You're the prophet that's to come. Jesus basically took a hand grenade, threw that over to Peter's little view, and just exploded it and said, I'm bigger than that. Because when Peter was saying, let's build a tent for each one of you guys, he said, I want to build three tents. Peter was saying, because there's you, Moses, there's you, Elijah, and there's you, Jesus. All three of you guys are great, wonderful authorities, right? And see, for the Jews, who did they have? They had Moses and his law. That's, that's what they followed religiously. They memorized it. They put it in their doorways. They put it around their heads. They prayed it. They memorized it. And this was the guy. Moses was the guy. And then they had the prophets represented by Elijah. So Peter's saying, we got all three of you. Let's party. We got the Hall of Fame. But then God shows up and says, there is one. One of you is my chosen one, Jesus. He is the supreme authority over all these. It was a transitioning period. 
Because for, a, for several, uh, for a thousand years, they've listened to one, one voice in Moses and the prophets. And now God is saying, now you listen to Jesus. He is the one. And Jesus gives us the interpretation of the law and the prophets. So he is uniquely called as the voice. So he's blown up this old view of Jesus. What is your picture of Jesus? Do we see him maybe as a great and mighty judge? Who when we go through our life and, and we make maybe a little bit of a mistake, he just comes down there and he's like, judge, time to bring the verdict. Whap! You shouldn't do that anymore. Oh, sorry. Sorry, great judge. Sorry, Jesus. Or do we think of him as maybe what I like to call the back pocket Jesus? You know, this little Jesus that you can kind of stick in your back pocket and then you're going through your life. You're going through your day and all of a sudden you come to this moment and you're like, oh no, um, I'm going to miss my deadline. I need, to, I need to work harder. I need, some, I need some Jesus power. And you pull it out and you're like, Jesus, I need you to get me through this right now. I, I need you right now or else I'm not going to be able to finish this assignment. I'm not going my, my, to get to where I need to go on time. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You finish your project and you just put them back in, Mr. Back Pocket Jesus. Or do we see Jesus as the transfigured one, the one who God decided to put his glory on, to make him the supreme authority over all other authorities, that we should listen to him and listen to him only. That is the Jesus that we need to believe in. Is your Jesus big enough? This is a question that my wife and I had to ask recently. As just about a year ago, uh, right before we started coming to Hope Community Church, uh, we had a really rough patch in our life. I'd lost my job, and we were moving all at the same time. And right before I lost my job, we found out that we're pregnant with this awesome blessing of a son. Talk about a stressful time, though. <laughs> Three things that, you sh- that uh, bring stress in your life. They say you should never do it at the same time. One, move. Two, change your jobs. Three, have a child. Like, all in the same moment, these three things are going on, and we are pulling our hair out. And it was at that time when we had to realize, is Jesus going to be enough to carry us through this time? Is Jesus, I mean, we were freaking out. I'm looking for jobs. I'm substitute teaching. I, I go into these schools that were so, I mean, teachers, you guys are amazing. I don't know how you do it. You go in and teach these students day in and day out, and then you just get them you know, perfectly disciplined, and then us substitutes come in and just everything breaks loose. <laughs> I mean, it just falls apart. And they pay me to be mean to these kids. I mean, it's like, I can't do this. So I was, I'm substitute teaching. I'm trying. My wife, who's pregnant, and God bless her hom- hormonal um, <laughs> in a little bit of a way, was, was also going crazy. And she's like, well, I'll get two jobs. I'm like, babe, you're growing a baby in you. You can't get, she's like, I'll work nights. I'll do whatever it takes. We're pulling our hair out, trying to figure out how we're going to pull all these loose ends together. Then we had to ask our question, is our Jesus big enough? Perhaps you're in a spot in your life. You're pulling your hair out. You've lost something. You don't know how things are going to be held together. Is Jesus big enough? This view of Jesus that we get here says, yes, he is big enough. He will blow up your little pocket-sized Jesus, and he will show up as the glorified son of the living God, the chosen one, and say, you can trust Jesus in me. Just follow me. Follow me. Application. Who do you know that has a more accurate view of Christ? Who do you know that has a more accurate view of Christ? Because you need to spend some time with that person. Uh, I I had the privilege of going to a couple Thursday night Bible studies here. They're great. They're very inspiring. It's great to come around a group of people and get encouraged. And one of the questions, I believe it was either Brian Kane that was leading or Mark, he said to the group, he said, who is Jesus to you? And I remember it was Miss Cindy who just got up there. And she, she was first, and you got a little Peter in you, you know. She was first, first one to say something. She said, well, he's, he's like my father. And it was almost like she was tearing up. She was like, he's like my father. He loves me. He loves me more than anything. He loves me. I think you got a, a clearer picture of Jesus. And we were to find people who have that clear picture of Jesus that love for us, that, that large Jesus, that we, the accurate picture of you, we should spend time with people like that. Implication number two. Jesus is the chosen one who is the suffering servant. You see, part of Peter's plan here to get them to stay was he was saying, no, Jesus, no, you don't need to depart. Stay here. Let's hang out. Let's make this last as long as we can. 
And if you look at the context of the passage, I put this in the outline, you can see a chiastic structure, meaning there's kind of this uh, X kind of pattern. Key is X in Greek, and nobody cares. I don't care either. It's okay. But, um, but it points to the middle part. It's saying the middle part is the most important. It's his glory is the most important part of the section, but it's in the context before and after of his departure is where his glory is so important. And Peter didn't want to see it that way. Peter didn't want this to change. He wanted it his way. Selfishly, he wanted his way on Jesus' life. He wanted to tell Jesus what to do. I think we can do that sometimes too. We can have want our way. And though we're praying maybe for God to do something, ultimately we're praying that God does what we want. See, listening is different than that. We're not telling, when we're praying and talking to God, we're not telling him what we want. We're listening so we can follow him better. The transfigured, glorified Christ is a suffering servant. And sometimes when we listen and follow him, that leads us to a, suff- a place of hardship and suffering. There's two scriptures I just want to point us to really quick that, that this points to. It's in Isaiah, and there's some servant songs in Isaiah that talk about and give us a picture, a clearer picture of Christ. The first one is Isaiah 42, verse 1. Isaiah, still, if you want to turn there, you can. I'll read it to you also. Isaiah's to the left. It's one of the bigger prophets in the, uh, in the Old Testament, after Psalms and Proverbs and all those good books. Isaiah 42, verse 1. I'll just read four verses here. And this, this is a prophecy that you'll see speaks directly to what God was saying when he's saying, this is my chosen one. And also, for, for some of us, when we say Jesus is an authority, an authority in your life, he's, he's to have an authoritative voice, sometimes we have a kind of a, 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 a skewed view of authority. Maybe we've had a, a, just a bad experience with an authoritative figure. We just don't really feel like, man, yeah, you say authority, and I think of this guy, and he really screwed me over with his, with his power. I don't like, you say, I'm, just, I'm against that. But look at this authority figure in Christ, Isaiah 42. He says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench, saying, he is not going to look at the, at the hurting, the poor, the ones that are in tough spot. He's not going to crush those that are weak, but he's going to lift those people up. He's like the Robin Hood of authority figures. He's with those people who are down and hurting and poor. He says, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice on earth in the coastlands wait for his law so that's a point that he is the chosen one that this is pointing to and then one more uh, Isaiah 53 if you flip over 10 chapters to the right this is a commonly referred to passage this is uh, one of the four servant songs in Isaiah about Christ verse 10 in Isaiah 53 says this yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him that's deep it was the will of the Lord to crush him He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Saying, it was God's desire. In this this way, it was God's desire for Jesus to go through the suffering, to pay for the penalty of our sins. Down there uh, at the bottom of verse 12, it says, He bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. He poured out his soul to death. There's a theology that exists that says God has no desire ever for any people ever to experience suffering whatsoever, ever done. Put a nail in the coffin, and that's it. Nothing. And if there is something in your life where you're like, man, this is hard. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't expect this to come. I'm hurting. I'm down. Well, that's your fault. You must have messed up. Dude, you jumped off the path because my life's great. Woohoo! I got God. Everything's going well. Oh, something's wrong with you. Yeah, well, that's your problem. You've got to figure it out. Get back on with God. Because God doesn't have anything bad happen to his people. And they believe, honestly, and they'll fight it. They'll fight it. They'll misquote a couple scriptures and say, no, God doesn't allow that to happen. But how can a loving God send his people to a place of hardship and suffering? That's, that's, that's a tough question. How could he do that? There's a, a guy, a poet in England in the 17th century. His name was John Donne. And uh, John Donne, 
followed his heart and married the love of his life, Anne. And John, Dunn, and then were married about a week before the father of Anne found out that they were married and didn't believe this to be a, 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 a sanctioned marriage. He take, took John, took the people that married him, took his uh, officiating best friend, and put them all into prison. And John sat in prison for years, right after just for marrying his love. And then he got sick. Sick beyond the, just scraping by to the point where he was even living for marrying this one he loved. And then he penned these words. He was a Christian man who wrote some great devotionals while being in prison for this. He penned these words. He said, The sickness which keeps me in bed forces me to think about my spiritual condition. Suffering gets my attention. It forces me to look to God when otherwise I would just as well ignore him. Is life always easy? I can tell you when I did lose my job about a year ago, I heard those voices coming in. God's left you. God's not going to take care of you. You've got to take care of yourself. You want to make something happen? You've got to do it. Don't trust in God. He's not, what is he going to do? He's up there. He's off in a distance. He even did this to you. Why would you trust in him? And there was this temptation to say, yeah, I've got to make it. I've got to do it on my own. But then we remember that picture of that Jesus who is big enough, that voice who is an authority, saying, follow me and I will take care of you. Come, those who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Sometimes suffering and hardship is in God's plan. And your hardship that you're going through is probably far exceeding anything I've ever gone through, but I can tell you, there's one who knows about it, and that is Christ, who has gone through that hardship and that hard time. He knows what you're going through, and he is with you. More than I could ever be, he is closer to you than your best friend. Jesus is the chosen one who is the suffering servant. Application, we should embrace God's pathway for us that may involve suffering. We should embrace God's pathway for us that may involve suffering. Slash, you want to add in there, hard things. It may. It doesn't mean that, hey, well, if that's, you know, if that's a place where I'm going to suffer and have my life torn apart, well, that's where God must be calling me to go. That's not the point. The point is to follow him. Follow him closely. And he walks us through those hard times. Follow him. And we will see him even closer, even better. Implication number three. Jesus is the chosen one who we should listen to. Jesus is the chosen one who we should listen to. They went to this mountain to pray. Oftentimes when we think of praying, we, think, we don't think of listening, but Kevin did a great job in that prayer series emphasizing listening as an aspect of prayer. And oftentimes when we hear listen, you need to listen to Jesus. Right away we think, oh, well, listen means, well, kind of like uh, I was always told growing up, listen to your mother. And what does that mean? Listen to your mother. It means you do what you, she says or, <laughs> or else, Right? Listen to your mom. Listen to your mom. It means obedience. And right away when we think, we hear this, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Listen to him. We think, well, that just means I got to do what he says. We got to be good people. We're pausing there, though, and we're jumping too quick to the fact that we need to listen to his voice. We need to listen. Deuteronomy 18.15 prophesied about Jesus coming. It said, there is a prophet who is coming who you should listen to. We hear these voices all the time, these false voices that often come from inside or from other people, other sources that are saying, hey, you are alone. There was a friend of mine uh, from a Bible study years back. Uh, we still keep in touch, and he emailed out. He's like, guys, I've been having a rough time. I've been going through this time where you know, I'm just feeling like I'm just carrying all these burdens. I'm trying to do too much at work. I'm trying to do too much in my family. I don't know what to do. And I'm feeling like nobody's here with me feeling like I'm left all by myself. I'm feeling like God's even left me. I'm feeling alone. He's hearing these voices. He's hearing these things that tell me he is alone. And all these guys, these in truth, start writing back, dude, we're with you. Don't listen to these voices. Jesus is with you. You are not alone. You've got to listen to his voice. Get away from all these other voices and just get to his voice. 
We need to identify, this is our application, we should identify the false voices in our lives and make space to listen to Christ. It takes space to listen to Christ. One way that I happen to have found that works for me to make space is to get outside, take my dog for a walk. I should be doing it any day anyways. He, you know, Chewy's a happier dog when I do it. I'm a happier person when I'm outside and in, you know, in the, the clean, fresh air and uh, taking my dog for a walk. I just happen to just talk to God. It just gives me space. I just talk to God. It probably looks like I'm talking to my dog, to be honest. People are like, why is he talking to his dog? I'm just talking to God as I'm walking. I'm just talking to God, sharing my heart with him, and then I listen. See if he's telling me anything that's matching with what happens in his word. I just listen. Oftentimes when I get grumpy, I get down, I got too much going on in my life. My wife sees it. She knows it. I'm short with her. Just tell me, go take a walk. <laughs> and she means it in that loving way. Go take a walk. Like, get with God. Walk with him. Be with him. Go take a walk. Identify the false voices in our lives and make space to listen to Jesus. Somebody once said that you, um, you should have a date night with Christ. You do a date night with your, with your spouse or your girlfriend. You make time. You set it up. You call. You make the reservation. Do that with Jesus. Say, yeah, Thursday night, just me and him. Get away. Take your Bible, prayer journal, whatever. Have a date night with Christ. So we have an authoritative voice, a voice we can follow and listen to in Christ. There was a time in my life when uh, this voice really spoke to me. This voice that said, hey, I want you, you know, I have something for you, Brian. And we need to seek this voice when we're going through times of decision-making, when we're thinking about our identity, who we are, when we're thinking about how we should live our life, we need to seek out this number one voice in the transfigured Christ. So the question I was asking myself uh, during this time was, was I was away on a missions trip with about 30 or 40 other college students, and I was praying about somebody who caught my eye. That was a girl. It happens. And I was, this particular moment, it wasn't my incredibly awesome wife, Lauren, who uh, God later blessed me with, but it was another girl who happened to catch my eye. And we started just hanging out a little bit on this trip. Um, and we began thinking, well, maybe God has a relationship for us. We said, well, we don't want to do anything that God doesn't have for us. Let's take time, pause, stop, and listen for what he has for us. Oftentimes, listening involves getting rid of distractions. So we decided uh, we'd take a time of fasting or we'd get rid of some distractions. Uh, for me, that was fasting from sports television, which is a big distraction for me. I watch a lot of it. And fasting uh, from food to focus more on hearing from God. So I'm listening, I'm reading some scripture, we're fasting for about a day and a half, and I'm like, God, I just want to know, what do you have for me with this girl? Is she the one for me? Is this it? Are we going to marry? Are we going to have babies? What is the plan? I just want to know, God, is this her? And it was during that second day when I was in a coffee shop. That's where I go a lot of times to meet God. I think it's the caffeine and, and all that just kind of speaks to me. I'm like, God, what do you have for me with this girl? And as clear as day, this has only happened to me that one time, I felt a verse pop into my head. It was 5.8. Proverbs 5.8. And I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't, I don't know Proverbs 5.8 off the top of my head. I didn't know what it was, but I thought, wow, I just heard from God. This is exciting. I wrote it down in my journal, Proverbs 5.8. Thank you, God. Thank you for this word. I can't wait to see what it is. I'm so excited that you spoke to me. I'm, ah. Oh. I'm just jazzed. I'm excited. And I turn to it. I'm going there. I'm like, all right, Proverbs 5, 8. This is a true story, by the way. It says, quote, Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what are you trying to say, God? And I got a little upset because I had already made my plans. Basically, I was just looking for a little affirmation. And I remember sitting in my car, and it was this giant 85 grand marquee, big rearview mirror, and a Jesus air freshener hanging. And I thought, Jesus, this is what you have for me? And I regret it to this day. I took that air freshener and threw it out the window. <laughs> really? And I sat on that for a couple days, and I said... Maybe I'm just not supposed to see her for a couple days. And I took a little break. And then we kept talking. We, we finished our mission trip. We kept talking on the phone. And, 
we'd call, I'd call her once a week, and we'd talk on the phone twice a week, kept talking, month, you know, month, two, three months go by, we're talking, I'm like, man, this is great, no, there's nobody else I'm talking to on the phone, this is, this is the girl, this is going well, so finally, one of my buddies said, you know, you should just see if she's feeling the same way, make sure this is going in the same direction, two coinciding lines meeting at the same point, right, that's a great idea, because I want to know when that point's going to be, get, these, get our lives started together, so I call her up and like, hey, you know, I just wanted to make sure we're on the same playing field here, you know, I've been going down this line and, you know, I don't really talk to very many other girls, I don't talk to any girls, uh, but you, um, <laughs> do you, you feel the same thing or what, what's the story? Well, I thought we were just really good friends. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I meant too. I meant, I meant... I met lots of friends. I mean, I had lots of friends. Oh, it hurts. It was painful. I'm like, great, that's, that's great. I got to go. Bye. I hung up the phone. I'm like, that was not at all what I expected. And I, I was floored. I had, my, I had my life figured out. I thought where I was going to go, I, you know, what we were going to do. I met kids' names. Um, and God said, no. I got, I, went, I got depressed right after that. And no joke, I had got pneumonia. I had to leave school and go home for 10 days. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I feel like God was up there like, eh, told you so. Like, <laughs> this is what you get. Like, I told you. I made it clear as day. <laughs> and what did you do? I know better. The smart guy. And then I met Lauren. <laughs> I did. I ignored him. I ignored him. Uh, about a year later, I took my prayer journal, made some space for God, and I wrote down what I was looking for in a wife. I said, I, you know, I want a wife who's beautiful. I want a wife who's godly. I want a wife who's a leader, uh, who loves sports, <laughs> <laughs> who plays sports, will be active, that will have adventures on, that will do some tremendous, you know, things for God. One year to the day that I wrote that letter, I was hanging out with a group of friends after a Bible study, and uh, this girl came in. She was involved with our Campus Crusade movement. Uh, we started hanging out that night. Five of us hung out till like four o'clock in the morning, talking about life, what we wanted to do with our lives, and what we wanted to be. What would be your perfect day? All those fun get to know you questions. Five o'clock in the morning, hanging out with these people, and the girls leave, and it's, it's us three roommates. And I'm talking to the guys. I'm like, you know, what I know of that Lauren girl, I think I'd date her for the rest of my life. We're still dating to this day, aren't we, babe? <laughs> so. We got married, and God did have a better plan for me once I began to follow him. Can God be the authoritative voice in your life? Is he worthy of that? The transfiguration says yes. When we're hearing these other voices, we need to stop. We need to drop ourselves in prayer to our knees and listen to that one clear voice in Christ. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a moment of silence, let us just kind of softly, on our own, hear God, listen to him, making a little bit of space, and then I'll close this in prayer. So band, if you guys want to come out, we'll close our time.